Crusader Kings 3 has just launched, and it is the next installment in the Crusader Kings series by Paradox Interactive. Crusader Kings has a notoriously high learning curve, but once you can break through that initial hurdle, you're in for tens of hundreds of hours of diverse and interesting gameplay. From the campaign dilemmas to taking an entirely different historical approach to a famous individual from the history books, the options are limitless. In this video today, I want to help those of you that are brand new to the series in breaking through that initial hurdle and learning curve. I struggled through so many little mechanics in my first 30 or 40 hours of gameplay, so allow me to show you the lessons I learned to save you the time I spent crashing and burning. These tips aren't earth shattering, and if you're a veteran of Paradox, you might not even learn a whole lot from this video, but hopefully these nine tips will get anyone started on the right foot to creating their kingdom in a Crusader Kings 3. If you're new to the channel, the way I like to approach my videos is front-loading the information at the beginning of the video so you can decide if what you're looking for. I mean, I've added chapters to the timeline which will give you the title of each one of my tips. This should help with easy referencing, but also in determining if this video is right for you. Before we jump into this list, if you haven't picked up Crusader Kings 3, you can find a link to Fanatical in the description that you can use to purchase the game, which will give you a Steam key. At the time of making this video, it was 12% off, and I do get a commission which does wonders to support the channel, and if you enjoy this type of content, I will be making plenty more guides. So don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below, and you'd be surprised how much it helps the YouTube algorithm. But let's get started. For our first tip, we're not even going to dive into the actual game. We're just going to go into the settings menu. And this is about the tooltip modes. Now you will come across this in the tutorial, I'm not gonna lie to you, but I'll be honest, I wish that this was like the first thing the tutorial went over. So when you hover over anything, you get this tooltip that appears on the right side. By default, it's on timer lock, meaning that after what I've set to 0.5 seconds, the little thing scrolls up, the border changes, and I can now go over this tooltip. Well, I have mine on action lock, so if I just press the middle mouse button, boom, it locks this tooltip and I can go over it. You also have another option for mouse tendency, which just means that the tooltip will automatically lock in place until the cursor moves away. Now, if you're playing this for the very first time, you're going to be going down a rabbit hole of looking at these individual highlighted texts and the tooltip mode is going to help you push through these much quicker because by default, this is, I think, on one second, and it goes like that. It takes forever for it to actually lock. This is going to speed up your learning process. Turn this to action lock, press middle mouse button, and you're popping right over to every single highlighted bit of information. Or if you really want to stay on timer lock, just bring it down to like 0.5 seconds. It's a much faster situation, and you can go through those tool tips and learn a lot more in a much smaller window. Our second tip is slow play the start. As a veteran of the Total War franchise and a number of other strategy games, there is a huge impulse to just start the game and start bashing around. Stop. You don't need to do that here. Once you start your campaign, the game will be paused, and from here, you can do so much. In fact, almost all the following tips can be done from this initial stage in the game for the most part. Getting your early stages cemented properly and completing all the little tasks the game lays out for you on day one are huge to ensuring that you're off on the right foot. What's nice about Crusader Kings 3 is that it presents a ton of options right out the gate for you to pursue by clicking the Issues tab right up here. This will outline any suggestions the game is making based off of certain circumstances or context clues for your current situation at hand. Take, for example, the vast amount of wars I can declare, or all three of my children that lack guardians. This will save you from clicking around all the menus in the game, helping you to not get overwhelmed. And I can't stress this enough, though. If you spend two or three hours on day one moving your way through all these tasks and making sure you're off on the right foot, then your campaign is going to go much, much smoother. Which actually leads me to my next point. Number three is about creating a plan. So while the game is paused, you should be devising a plan for at least the initial stages of your campaign. If you have a clear objective in mind, great, stick with that and have at it. But Crusader Kings is very much about planning and putting that plan into action. Take a look at uh, Robert Giscard, the famed Norman Duke of Apulia here. From my Issues tab, uh, we can see that I have plenty of wars to declare, or I've got my lifestyle I have to take care of, 
or I've got all of my vassals that I need to maybe influence their opinion of me. Plenty of things. This is a crucial time to map out where and how I want to take advantage of these claims or where I want my campaign to go. As you become more familiar with the game though, you can use the map filters in the lower right to help you execute this plan. So for this campaign, my primary objective is to create a kingdom and become the king of said kingdom. By selecting the kingdoms tile or by pressing I, I can create a clear plan for the future of my campaign as it maps out the territories needed to create the kingdom of Sicily and subsequently I become the king of Sicily. Now, don't feel married to where you start. I mean, I could just as easily say that I'm going to spend the beginning of my campaign cementing claims abroad and expanding out there. But you just first have to create the plan for the direction of your campaign. Opening up the door to number four, marriage and diplomacy. Diplomacy is a huge part of Crusader Kings, cementing claims to foreign lands, ensuring vassals won't rise up against you, or securing the aid from a much stronger and more equipped nation to aid you in your conquests throughout the medieval world. The easiest way to establish diplomacy is by simply marrying off your children in arranged marriages. With a male child, you gain the ability to acquire titles and claims without forging them, or marrying your brother to powerful rulers can help expand your dynasty. Your daughters can also help you secure very strong alliances across the map. By right-clicking my heir, Beaumont de Otteville, I can find him a spouse. You know, just like popping on down to Walmart aisle 8. From this menu, you can really get spicy with finding a spouse that works best for the aforementioned plan you created a little bit ago. The drop-down here allows you to select certain filters for your wife, such as alliance power or prestige gain. Alliance power is determined by the military of the family you're establishing an alliance with, and prestige gain refers to, well, the prestige gained by doing so. Marrying into a stronger family will often give you both. Now, you don't just select any old person from the list. Uh, make sure any alliance you want to create are alliances that will play into the plan of expansion you have in mind. While having, you know, William the Conqueror as an ally would be great, it will take him a considerable amount of time to reach me in the event that there is a war as he's all the way up here in England. So any alliances you create, make sure they're close enough to aid you or they fit in with the future expansion of your kingdom. For example, I would probably benefit more from marrying into an alliance with the Duchy of Carinthia since it is so close to my territory and it gives me an ample amount of troops that can help me um, actually in any kind of conflict with 667 right here. Furthermore, selecting an ally like maybe Hungary would be good for my Baltic campaign into the Byzantine Empire further in my campaign. Our next tip, hold off on buildings, is more a word of caution than a full-blown tip like the other ones. In the tutorial campaign, as you play the budding King of Munster, you start out with an exorbitant amount of money, as well as the ability to quickly gain more through easy conflicts. When you jump into your first non-tutorial campaign, you'll find that that is very much not the case, unless you get to play a raiding faction that can get a lot of money in the beginning of the campaign quickly. Take Robert Giscard once more. He starts with 55 gold up here, and that's not even enough to build a single building in any territory, as you can see right here. It's hardly enough to make a regiment of men at arms. So, you should really hold off on making any more buildings in your holdings until you've dealt with at least the first bit of wars offered up to you at the start of your campaign. They have a high upfront cost and they take a considerable amount of time to produce, so you won't reap the benefits for many years to come, quite literally. The reason you want to complete those wars is because of the amount of money you can make from capturing new lands or ransoming off captured characters. Take the county of Salerno, for example. Now, we aren't at war, but if I click the various holdings in this county, you can click right there and there, um, I can see the loot gathered from occupying, like in the case of a castle, or raiding, like in the case of this city. Now, by taking these locations, I will have earned 45 gold alone, not to mention how much I will make from winning a war with this county or any ransoms I would get from prisoners gained. So, hold off on making those buildings until you have far more gold at your disposal. 
Number six, Expand Fast, is about taking those initial claims to territory and really running with them from the start. If I haven't outlined it enough in my previous point, wars are a quick way to gain a lot of money quickly. You can also further your military lifestyle if you've gone down that path, like I probably would with Robert Giscard. Now, in order for you to go to war, you need a casus belli, or a reason for war. These are created by the various claims that the game has to offer. Unpressed, pressed, and implicit claims. And those implicit claims are given to children on all titles held by their parents. There is also holy wars, which are wars against two conflicting faiths. The biggest difference between these two is that a holy war will allow you to appoint new vassals, and anyone on either side of the face can contribute to a holy war. With a standard war with a claim, you will take the land over and just simply gain a new vassal. Continuing our example here, I can issue a holy war against any of these three nations in Sicily, and I want to do so quickly. If you expand slowly, you're giving the AI a chance to cement their own alliances with nearby characters that will bring their military might to the fore should you decide to wait. In my tutorial campaign, the Earl of Oriel over here, um, he created an alliance with England, preventing me from being able to take his territory because I waited an extra few months before attacking him. If you have a claim, and you have the troops, do the war and move quickly. Getting pulled into a protracted war with an opponent with a strong alliance is very damning, especially in the early portions of the campaign, and especially when that ally is close. Our next tip is about vassals and your relationships with them. Now this isn't necessarily about their actual opinion of you as the tutorial covers how to sway and influence that quite easily. More this is about looking at your vassals needs to actually supply your war effort. Vassals are important for a number of reasons linked to your court, wards, guardians, alliances, so on and so forth. But first, among all of those things is that your vassals provide you with gold via taxes and soldiers via levies. By pressing F2, and opening the realm tab, we get a great breakdown of our vassals, their opinion of you, and their feudal contract if they're not, uh, say, a republic vassal like this one is down here. From this menu, we can also see the total amount of levies and taxes coming in from your personal domain as well as your vassals. Now, this is the important part I wanted to showcase. Hover over this icon right there. This shows us that levies and taxes are reduced since we are not this vassal's rightful liege. If we continue to read the tooltip, it tells us the requirement for us to become the rightful liege. Uh, for example, here it says I have to be the uh, have to hold the Duchy of Sicily. This is so so important. I have five vassals, and I'm making 1.5 gold from them, which is pitiful, and it's all because I am not the rightful liege of three of these vassals. Furthermore, I'm also not getting additional troops from them. When you hover over the levies bar, which is right here, uh, you will be able to find out how many troops you're receiving from the vassal. Hovering over the contribution will then tell you any contributing or limiting factors to this contribution. As it is, all of these vassals that don't see me as their rightful liege are having both their levy and tax contribution. Fixing this and making it a part of your great plan for your campaign is paramount, and this will increase both your army size and your income. Tip number eight is about the decisions menu, which is also consequently accessed by pressing F8. Now, this is an ever-evolving menu that will continue to change depending on the course of action you take throughout your campaign. And honestly, it gives great tips for the initial stages like we talked about in creating a plan. It's split by two types, major and minor. These major decisions will take up a considerable amount of time to ramp up towards, and are more than likely mid to late game goals. They're not bad to have as objectives for yourself though. So like we said earlier, my goal is to create a kingdom, and we can see that that represented on this list, but some are much further down the line, like Consecrate Bloodline, which requires 2,500 piety. Now, the minor decisions are usually smaller decisions that you should really knock out ASAP, depending on the circumstances that you find yourself in. This is a great place to look at at the start of the campaign to get some good initial ideas for what you should take care of first. Honestly, searching for a physician should be one of the first things you do. This will help you if your ruler becomes ill and can spare them from dying outright. 
or they can aid any of your knights that get gravely wounded in battle, recovering them from the brink of death. Inviting knights can help strengthen the core of your military, and inviting claimants are individuals that allow you to have claims to lands without forging or marrying into them. The decisions menu is a very powerful tool, and one you should check back on periodically as you progress through the game. All right, our last tip is think four steps ahead. This is a simple credo that you should apply when playing Crusader Kings 3. Any action you take is not so much about the immediate benefit of gaining, say, a specific duchy or marrying into an alliance. Rather, it should be about expanding your future horizons. This, again, plays so heavily into creating a plan. Have I hammered that point hard enough yet? This tip is really going to come down to you and your individual style of play, but it will also require you to really think about all the tools at your disposal. Remember, everything in Crusader Kings takes time to complete, so you need to be thinking of things to do during that time or things that will come to fruition at that moment of completion, leading to a domino effect. Let's take this campaign for example and my objective of creating a kingdom. If we want to create the kingdom of Sicily, as we've uh, tried too many times now, we'll need to take Sicily Actual, as well as Salerno, Capua, Naples, and the rest of Benevento. Since we can wage a holy war against all three of these baronies down here in Sicily, I should start working on forging a claim to Salerno now with my bishop by pressing this button and fabricating that claim. Now this will take me a good chunk of time, 17 months to be exact, but hopefully by that time I'll have united Sicily, secured the titles necessary to gain more levies and taxes from the respective vassal, and I have another target in Salerno now. All the while I can be, say, looking for secrets with my spy master to get blackmail income here, I'll just choose Roma, we'll, we'll go for the papacy. Now this is just one example. but. Hopefully, it gives you a frame of reference on how you should be thinking about Crusader Kings 3. This is not a game of immediate gratification, but rather you weaving an elaborate plot towards the ultimate goals of your kingdom. And at that, it brings our video to a close here. So if you have any other tips that you would like to share or you're a veteran of the series and there's some things that you picked up quickly that you think would really help out, please, by all means, share them in the comment section below. I know this game can have a daunting uh, barrier of entry or a learning curve, but hopefully these nine tips really helped break that down a little bit more for you. And once you kind of break the game to its constituent parts, it's much easier to tackle. It took me a couple hours, but you'll get there. Um, and I'm still not there. I'm still not an expert. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below. We'll be streaming this game all week, and I'm really excited to jump into more comprehensive guides for Crusader Kings 3. But as always, have a good one, and take care.